to Chef AJ Live. So thank you so much for being here. I just want to tell you, this is the very last day that I'll be doing more than one broadcast a day. I've done over 100 broadcasts since the sheltering in place began, sometimes going live two, three, and even four times a day. But I've got to get down to work and brass tacks. So starting tomorrow, Monday, June 1st, I still will be doing the daily live show with interesting guests like today's guests. As I mentioned, this show is about nice people for nice people. But I'll only be going live once a day. And we now have a regular time, 11 a.m. Pacific time every day. There'll be one exception in June, in June where I have a doctor from Australia who if we did it at 11 a.m., it would be 3 a.m. So that one day we're going to be doing it 3 p.m. So if you would consider please subscribing to me on YouTube and clicking that notification bell, you will know whenever I go live because sometimes it's impromptu. I sometimes like, if you remember at the very beginning of the show, a doctor at Trunor said, hey, let's go live. People are suffering. They're struggling. It was like 10 o'clock at night. So please consider subscribing to me on YouTube or better yet on my mailing list because you get your question preferential treatment when you write back to us when we tell you who the guest is, which we do try to do every day as well as send out the replay. This is actually this guest has been on three times. So he's not the person I've interviewed the most. That will be tomorrow's guest to kick off the new time. But the, the most I've had on this show, this is his third time. Why? Because he is so kind and generous to offer to come back because you guys, every time he's on, he is so inspirational, which is why he He's a Sunday guest that you say, please have him on again. And today he's going to be talking about autoimmune disease and more. We should call this Sundays with Stefan. Please welcome Dr. Stefan Esser. Thank you again. Yay. You, you, you're in the lead now with three, three. All right. Moving up in the numbers. <laughs> well, thank <laughs> you so for the uh, chance to join you again, Chef AJ. And thank you for all the work that you've been doing to inspire and educate people over the last period of time and moving forward. So thank well, you I that. appreciate that. And without yeah. wonderful mm -hmm. caliber, just inspirational people like you, I mean, I always think on this show, I'm the techie and I, I learn as much as everybody else. So what have you got for us today, Dr. Esser? You know, autoimmune disease is a real problem in America and around the world. And our bodies, it would seem like over the last number of decades have begun to attack us even more. And uh, autoimmune disease just seems like such a common phenomenon that I thought it was really important we talk about it. So I put together a PowerPoint presentation thought we could hit some of the actual science and then bounce back and forth with conversation. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. Let's do it. All right, well, I'm gonna go to share screen here. We're gonna pull it up and we're gonna walk through this together. So, um, you know, understanding autoimmune disease, for your viewers today, I want them to walk away knowing more about their body, how it works, and what's going on when it does not work. Obviously, love to have more people hang out with me on Instagram and Facebook, so there's a shout out. If you ever have a chance, come uh, hang out with me, try to put fun, exciting things on there, uh, that right along with Chef AJ. So, we're going to look at some definition, statistics, hit the classroom, talk about common autoimmune disease and really talk about opportunities for you to prevent, manage, and reverse where possible. So let's start basic, shall we? Autoimmune disease. Auto means self, immune to defend or to protect. So really, this is a disease in which the body misdirects an immune attack against its own cells, causing damage and injury. And when we look, what we know is that it is the third most common category of disease in the US right now with five to 8% of population having an autoimmune disease. And so that's 20 to 50 million Americans. And interestingly, almost 80% oh, are women. So why does this matter? Well, when you think about it, there are more than a hundred different autoimmune diseases and they can attack all these different body regions. You see the thyroid there, the brain, the blood, the GI tract, muscles, skin, lung, et cetera. So for many people, when they're wondering what's going on in their body, sometimes it actually is an autoimmune disease. For example, I had a patient just recently with ongoing repetitive fractures in their body, but the real heart of the matter was that they actually had an autoimmune disease of the thyroid gland that was impairing growth everywhere. So it can show up in many different ways. Statistically, when we look, rheumatoid arthritis is the most common, then psoriasis, Crohn's, type one diabetes, MS, and lupus. Now, interesting, when you look at this predilection for male versus female, you can see how this lines up, where things like Sjogren's and lupus and thyroid disease and autoimmune hepatitis, far more common in women than in men. And then we get to the far right, we start seeing an equalizing 
and ulcerative colitis. And then males tend to have a little more type one diabetes and a little more myocarditis, which is attacking the heart muscle. And so a little widespread there. So what do we know? Let's review that, right? Autoimmune disease is common. We said it's a third most common group of diseases, can affect almost any tissue in the body, women more affected than men, and each one with a unique predilection. So let's take you to mini medical school, right? You don't have to spend $200,000 like I did, but we can hit up some factoids here. So immunity really is the ability of your body to protect itself from harmful environmental influences. So this would be what's so crucial, especially now with coronavirus and COVID-19 that we've talked about. And when you think about that immune system, there are all these different parts. They're all working together in unison to keep you healthy, to keep you safe. So the bone marrow, right? That's where your immune cells are formed. The thymus, this little small gland near your heart, right in the center of your chest wall, where these immune cells are educated. And then all these lymph nodes under your chin, in your groin area, under your arms, so on and so forth. These little tiny organs really function as filters and short-term storage and education sites. So you imagine these cells being produced in the bone marrow, then they're like a little kid, they're going out and they go to sites of education that could be the lymph nodes, could be the thymus, so on and so forth. And then the lymphatics are the highways, the, may, the way in which these little cells travel throughout your body. So it's just amazing to think about how all this is working together consistently for so many of us our entire lifetimes. Now, one thing that's crucial to remember is that your gut is where 70 to 80% of your immune system lives. People forget this. And this is why it's so crucial that your gut is healthy and full of health promoting foods, all those fiber and the prebiotics of all those fiber that you're eating. Uh, so when you think about this, your gut associated lymphatic tissue is lining your intestinal tract. So when you eat something or something goes through your nose, into your mouth, into your stomach, that's how it then gets to your immune system because the immune system is right outside of your intestinal tract. So you can see this nice little picture here, this drawing. So in the blue area above the lumen, it says that's inside your small intestines. And so as the different food or bacteria or viruses that get into your mouth, they get exposed to the line of the intestinal tract and then drawn through into what are called Peyer's patches. This is where all of the little lymph nodes are with all of these B cells. And it's just amazing how it's working together. Here's a fun little cut of an actual histopathology slide, we call it. They took a section of someone's intestine and you can see that mucosal associated lymphatic tissue, your intestine on the top, and then this immune system right below. So what happens there, right? Well, first of all, we, as I mentioned in the bone marrow, you've got all of these different cells that are being produced, that are maturing, and that all have different roles. So you want to think that really your immune system has two major parts to it. One is the basic first line of defense, uh, things like mucus, things like the lining of your intestinal tract, your skin, uh, and also basic things like fever. All too often people think fever is something you don't want, but really fever is how your body initially begins to fight off an infection. So that fever is where your body's heating up to a temperature at which bacteria and viruses cannot multiply like they normally want to. And it results in killing them off and decreasing their rapid growth. Then we've got acquired immunity, right? This is actually where you get an adaptive response to something your body's been exposed to. But again, there's that innate immunity, right? The epithelial barriers, things called phagocytes, these fascinating little cells that if a virus or bacteria gets into you, these phagocytes come over and just absorb it like a little Pac-Man eating them up. And so all of these are working together. And then your adaptive immunity is where you actually begin to create a memory, a memory of things you've been exposed to. So for example, if you've been exposed to a certain flu virus over the years and you got a little flu-like symptom, but then immediately got better, your body produces B cells, these B cells produce antibodies. And these antibodies are like little pictures of bad people, if you will, floating around in your bloodstream that if that bad person ever shows up at your door, you go, aha, there you are. I remember seeing you on America's Most Wanted. And so immediately you can have your uh, forces protect you. And so that's that adaptive immunity that is constantly creating a memory, a learned memory for your body for long-term protection. In order for you to understand immunity and autoimmunity, I want you to also understand these two terms, 
One is antigen. This is a toxin or a foreign substance that gets into you and then can induce an immune response. And then antibodies, which as I mentioned, these little proteins produced in response to exposure to an antigen. So that bacteria, that virus gets into you. And then what happens next is, right? You get this memory. And that's what the antibodies are that are circulating in you. Here are a couple other quick factoids that are worth thinking about. Infants lack fully developed immune systems. Chronic stress impairs your immune function. Inadequate sleep impairs immune function. Poor nutrition also. And with age, our immune system declines. It becomes a little less active. So immunity is complex, tightly regulated, and there are both basic and adaptive abilities to it. So really just an amazing system at its heart. Chef AJ, any of your viewers have any good questions about any of that? Or are we all on, uh, we all rolling good? Well, so far they do have questions, but not specifically on that. They're just saying like, thank you for these trainings, says Karen. Florence says, super interesting. He's so good, easy to understand, such a generous man. Joanne says, she's here to learn. So nothing specific yet about autoimmune disease. We have All some right. orthopedic questions, but we can save those. <laughs> we'll keep on flowing. So let's get back to your gut, right? Because this is really the heart of the matter. And I want to walk through this with you. So I want you to look at the picture on the right of your screen and you're going to see these little square, if you will, pink rectangles, if you will, little tiny little dots or projections on the top. And it says tight junctions. And then over the right of the screen, it says leaky or inflamed junctions. So what you want to know is the following, that in your intestinal tract, when food, vac bacteria, viruses, anything like that gets in there in the intestinal tract, it should be broken down until it's tiny, tiny little pieces, if you will. Only those can sneak through what are healthy intestinal walls, where it's tight junctions, things are very tight together. However, if you're unwell, if you have dysbiosis, unhealth in your intestinal tract, if you eat the standard American diet, if you're taking a lot of anti-inflammatories for your chronic knee pain, these all cause leaky junctions. They make the intestinal cells not stick together as tightly, and instead they widen. And as they widen, now inadequately digested or inadequately broken down toxins, bacteria, viruses, or even just amino acids that are still connected to form a protein can get through that and into your bloodstream. And that's where they can cause havoc. We're going to talk a lot about this because as I mentioned, 80% of your immune system is in the gut. So those mucosal layers are a primary interface through which you develop your immunity, but also that protects you from things you don't want inside of you. And if steps are skipped or shortened, then we get inappropriate exposure. Because imagine this, imagine I eat that apple that I didn't fully wash. Maybe I dropped on the ground, I picked it up, had some bacteria, I bite into it. Now, first that goes in my mouth with all of the amylase and the different enzymes, then my esophagus, then my stomach with all the hydrochloric acid, then into my intestines where it's hit up with all kinds of pancreatic enzymes, and then it gets to my gut. But so if bacteria survived in any form all the way in there, which is unlikely, but if they did, they've been through a lot of steps versus let's say I get a cut on my skin and the bacteria gets right through the skin into my bloodstream. Well, now it's bypassed a lot of different measures before I got exposure. And this is where we want to talk about how it all goes wrong. So stick in the right here, folks, the theory of autoimmune disease and causation. Let's start with risk factors. So what's in your control when it comes to autoimmune disease and what's out of your control? Out of your control, genetics, previous exposures, toxins, in various infectious agents that you may have had uh, over the years, and that's past. What's in your control now? Food, sleep, emotions, exercise, emotional poise, toxins now, and infectious agents now. We're gonna go through these, we're gonna go quickly. Because here's what I wanna remind you. I can see this fancy little drawing I made for you, for Chef AJ here. So imagine a little graph like this and the line going across, it says symptoms because each one of us inherently is different. We may have a genetics that has a major part that primes us for autoimmune disease. Let's say my mother had rheumatoid and my cousin has type one and my you know, diabetes and my other cousin has MS. My other cousin, well, wow, that would suggest that I have a genetic inheritance that is more at risk for autoimmune disease. So that might be that person who's right in the middle. You see big portion 
of their risk for symptoms is genetics. And then they get some little exposure to some little virus or bacteria, and it gets through their gut lining inappropriately. They get this upregulated immune response, and boom, they get an autoimmune disease. Versus other people, it's a mix. It's about gut health. It's about the food they eat, so on and so forth. Now, many of you know my grandfather for 65 years ran this health ranch, 30,000 patients, et cetera. Well, growing up there, I can tell you that about 80 to 90% of people with autoimmune disease respond radically to food. That leaves you about 10 to 20% of people who may have major autoimmune diseases, but they just do not respond well to food. They don't get fully well, but the majority do. So when we think about treating autoimmune disease, we want to think in that paradigm, what's in control, what's out of your control. There are conventional approaches, so this is just going to be suppress your immune system and treat symptoms. So a great example, I saw a woman last week in clinic. I had seen her four years ago. And at that time, I said, look, you really need to make radical changes in the food you're eating. We need to build your gut lining back up. We need to get you healthy and get your immune system back on track. She was not ready. She was in pre-contemplation still. And she went off and she's seen about 10 different physicians in the autoimmune world and is now on multiple medications and her symptoms are still no better. And she's just progressing down this negative road. So she came back because she said, I finally realized I need to do what you said. Now what should I do? So I'm excited to see how she does in the next several weeks because the lifestyle approaches, what they focus on is risk reduction, trigger avoidance, normalizing your immune response, and then treating the symptoms. So let's go into this because you need to be empowered to know how you can treat your own autoimmune disease or help prevent it. The theories on causation for autoimmune disease are the following three. One, leaky gut and dysbiosis. Two, molecular mimicry. And three, the hygiene hypothesis. Let's start with leaky gut. So as I mentioned, the idea here is that when you have dietary inadequacies, when you're under chronic stress, et cetera, we begin to get loose cell membrane connections in the gut. So incompletely processed materials can enter your bloodstream. Then this spawns an abnormal signal and the body begins to attack itself. Let's think about this. The ones that have been shown in the scientific literature to clearly induce this sort of an autoimmune response include all of these. You can see parvovirus, Coxsackie, Mycobacterium avium, Salmonella, Shigella. All of these have been shown to result in increased gut sort of looseness, right? These leaky gut and induce autoimmune responses, as well as all of these toxins that you can see here. So if you look into the literature, what you're going to see is all of these things. So this is a lot of stuff that we get into our food, that we get in heavily processed foods in particular, but even as you see, simple things like gluten, which we're going to talk about. So glucose, salt, emulsifiers, organic solvents, food colorings, dyes, etc., they all increase intestinal permeability. So they widen those junctions between the cells, which then allows inadequately digested proteins or bacteria and virus to sneak into your bloodstream. And here's where we get into molecular mimicry. So check this out. So look on the far left of your screen, there's gluten. Imagine that gluten, which of course is wheat protein, et cetera. If we look, imagine that it's made up of the following amino acids, A, T, R, Z, V. Because for your viewers out there, remember, proteins are made up of amino acids all strung together like a string of pearls, each one with a different name to it. Now, when you eat the foods that are, have protein in them, what should happen is the protein gets broken down its constituent amino acids into each little pearl. So that you just have one little pearl and that can sneak in between your cells of your intestinal tract and get absorbed. But let's say four or five pearls are still held together on the string and they sneak through. This is where we get into trouble. So gluten, imagine it's ATRZV. Then you've got your thyroid, right, gland. Imagine that's CTRZZ. And then your cerebellum, which is the bottom of your brain. Imagine that is PTRZT. What do you notice? You see in blue there that the TR and the Z are all identical. So if you read too quickly, you might be like, oh yeah, they look very similar. So imagine now, take a look just below, and you're going to see here, this is a nerve cell membrane. You can see the different shape of it on the far left of your screen, and you can see the little zigzaggities, et cetera. So that's a nerve cell. Well, now look just below it. That is the covering of a type of bacteria called Campylobacter jejuni. 
So that's a bacteria that we don't want necessarily inside of us. But if it gets into you through your food, on your fingers, et cetera, now look, the end of the cell for the bacteria is very similar to the end of the cell of one of your nerve membranes. So if some of these get into you, or as you saw with the gluten, if the gluten goes in and you're a gluten sensitive person, your body begins to think that, wow, this is abnormal, this is foreign. It begins to attack the Campylobacter bacteria or begins to attack the gluten, but then it begins to attack you because the thyroid, the cerebellum looks so similar to the gluten molecule. Let's walk through this. So this is where we start getting into trouble. And we're gonna go more into that in just a minute, but here's the hygiene hypothesis one as well. This is the idea right? That as we've become cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, we've decreased exposure to bacteria early on in life when a child's immune system is developing so rapidly that would have otherwise allowed that immune system to have a more balanced approach because it's been exposed to so many different things over time. So here are the theories. A genetically primed individual gets gut integrity that is lost or a compromised immune state it then gets the toxic or infectious exposure. And then, boom, we get this overzealous response or a misdirected response. This is where it's fascinating because when they've taken people with rheumatoid arthritis, certain groups of them, and they've actually taken a little bit of the membrane of their joints that are all inflamed and be damaged, they find some cross-referencing to bacteria like Shigella and Salmonella and Parvovirus. So the body's begun to misunderstand the information and thus begin to attack itself. And this is where we get into trouble. So prevention, that's the first thing we all want. We want to have a normal gut permeability. In other words, very tight junctions. And the best way to do that that's demonstrated in the scientific literature is a plant-based program of minimally processed whole foods with as few toxins added as possible. We want to avoid and minimize toxic and infectious exposures and thus limit the friendly fire. So to reduce that gut permeability, we want to increase fiber, have healthy gut probiotics, avoid food additives and processing, and minimize or eliminate meat and dairy use especially, and avoid gluten, especially avoiding gluten as a primary calorie source. So how does that work? Well, fiber cultivates healthy bacteria. It reduces bowel exposure to toxins, and it crowds out, of course, low fiber foods. But all those fiber-rich foods are excellent sources for the healthy bacteria you want in your gut. So this is where it's interesting. So for example, if you take people who have ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory disease of the lining of their intestines, and you either give them a high dose probiotic or you give them a drug called mesalamine, they're equally as effective. In addition, right, you can look at these studies that are listed there as well. Well, when we alter someone's gut biome with healthy bacteria, we reduce rheumatoid arthritis inflammation. We reduce Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But you want to remember something, right? Is that the only source of fiber are plants. And so we want to be increasing the consumption of plants if you have a high risk for autoimmune disease. These are all studies that you can see here published in the literature that show the more fruits and vegetables you eat, the lower risks of these diseases occur. So whether... MS, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, inflammatory bowel disease, so on and so forth. I always love this study for my patients. I, I show them this study in which, you know, people who had significant autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease were placed on a, even just a semi-vegetarian diet and it prevented recurrence by 94% over several years as compared to 33% on the omnivorous diet. I mean, this is powerful medicine and that's why we all need to be incorporating this as our anti-autoimmune treatments. What about you know, chemicals? Chemical toxins are real. And so we wanna limit our exposure to them as much as possible. Eating more organic foods, washing the fruit and veggies well, using glass stainless steel, minimize plastics when possible, drinking only purified water, etc. But the ultimate molecular mimicry, right, is really meat. So see all these studies you can see here? Animal-based foods, increasing gut permeability, increasing the risk of all the common autoimmune diseases. So this is crucial that 
all of your viewers out there, if any of them are still eating meat, they put it down and be done with it. It's time to move on for, they plan, for the planet, for the animals, as well as for their own health. But you look at this, the ultimate molecular mimicry, especially when leaky gut is present, is neat. Why? Well, because our proteins look so similar to those of the animals that we consume. And so if they sneak through an incompletely digested protein, sneaks in, boom, there comes your autoimmune disease. Now, people ask me this question all the time. They go, what about if I'm not gluten sensitive? Well, can it help me with my autoimmune disease? This was brought up actually recently because a doctor a friend of mine, he did my four week detox challenge and he lost like 30 pounds, but his wife was doing it with him and she has thyroid disease. And he's like, it's crazy. She doesn't need as much thyroid medicine as she used to need. And she had an autoimmune thyroiditis. And the studies are clear on this, that yes, even if you don't have gluten clear, like celiac sprue, that if you get the gluten out, it's good for your other autoimmune diseases. And why? Well, because gluten increases gut permeability and also gluten cross-references other structures in our body. In other words, there's the molecular mimicry. Our body attacks the gluten and then begins to attack us a little bit as well. So absolutely, if you struggle with joints that are sore and achy, even if you don't have a true autoimmune disease, or if you struggle with fatigue or constant bowel dysfunction, get the gluten out and keep it out for about three months and see your body's response before you begin to add any back in. So we wanna also minimize the number of drugs that you need. This is what's so great about what Chef AJ is promoting all the time, is that if you're doing her program, right, you get her book unprocessed and you follow exactly what she says, you're losing the weight, you're getting off blood pressure meds, getting off diabetic meds, you don't need as many of these medications that cause leaky gut for so many people. In addition, get as natural as you can with the things you schmear on your face, right? And bathe in every night, et cetera. We really want to work on this. I was thinking about this today when I was outdoors playing around with a lot of children, et cetera, and my family, et cetera. I was like, oh, put on some sunscreen, trying to go for that reflectant sunscreen rather than the chemical based. So this is very important for us. The next infectious exposures. You know, minimize sick contacts. That doesn't mean that, you know, if your spouse or child is sick, you leave them in the room all by themselves, never see them. But it means just be smart about it, that if somebody is actively unwell, that it may not be the best time to spend, you know, time with them. Use appropriate precautions, right? Uh, especially these days. Enhance your immune function as well, right? To minimize the duration and extent of symptoms if you do get infected. And this is where it's interesting to me because since I grew up in this movement, Chef AJ, right? I mean, growing up as a kid, if we began to get a little, uh, you know, upper respiratory thing, the first response, my grandfather just said, well, we're just going to fast you for a day. So you just drank water for a day, which upregulated your immune system and stripped out all excess glucose from your bloodstream. So the bacteria and the such couldn't grow. And boom, you'd be better in a day, just one day of fasting, right? Rather than multiple days. I remember, well, I had a family member who actually got shingles in their 20s or 30s from a very high stress life and less than ideal food consumption. And my grandfather, they were like, what do we do? What do we do? And he said, just fast. They fasted for three days and it completely disappeared. No pain, complete resolution. Why? Because you're giving your body, right? The environment in which it can take care of acute illness very readily. And the reality is if we're trying to reduce our exposure to these bacteria and viruses, the best place to start is actually getting meat and dairy out of your diet. Because again, the majority of these food-like substances, right, are contaminated. Here's a great study here, right? The retail meat is contaminated. 90% of stores had contaminated chicken. I mean, this was, they just went store to, to store and literally took samples and found all of these stores with contamination. Remember, we talked about Campylobacter earlier and it's cross-referencing with molecular mimicry. So get that out, it needs to go. What about sleep and stress? Well, here's some studies that would suggest that the more stress we're under, the inadequate sleep we receive, the higher the risk of autoimmune diseases. So I tell people, especially right now, I mean, I find myself, if I spend too much time on the internet, on you know, the news, and then this, I get so worked up and so stressed, I don't even sleep well. So it's crucial that you follow good sleep hygiene, no internet, no computers within two hours of bedtime, and do some mind body work every day and stay away from the sites that you know drive your blood pressure up. So what do we know? We're closing out here. Genes, infections, microbiome, environment, these all play together 
to form this overlap place where autoimmune disease lives. So your prevention plan based on the science should be more minimally processed, pure plant foods, minimize gluten, minimize and eliminate meats and dairy, avoid repeat infections and food sources with infectious agents, get the toxins, the drugs out where possible and maximize sleep and stress reducing behaviors. I tell people it's also valuable when you're getting started with this for your autoimmune is consider a period of an elimination diet. So that's gonna strip out all of these common allergens and filling their place with all of these wonderful complex carbohydrates along with these berries and greens, et cetera. So a lot of people who do my four week program, et cetera, right? They come out, oh, my psoriasis is better. My this is better, et cetera, as far as autoimmune disease. We wanna rebuild your intestinal wall so if you've been on a lot of antibiotics, for example, or a lot of drugs, then a short course of probiotics certainly has its place. And then you wanna enhance your immune system as much as possible as we mentioned. I think it's important for you to know your risk. You need to know your personal risk, your family history and past exposures, and then develop a goal-oriented plan based on that. So if you have no autoimmune disease in your family at all, you have no symptoms to suggest autoimmune disease, et cetera, well then for you having a little gluten here and there may not be a big issue. But for the next person over has a strong family history and a lot of symptoms that seem like they may be autoimmune disease, getting the gluten out along with all the other toxins or other exposures is very reasonable. Then every couple months or so you wanna evaluate, how am I doing? How's this going? How are my joints? How's my overall health? How's fatigue? how's hair growth, so on and so forth. So autoimmune disease is complex, multifaceted. Genetic and environmental factors play a part, but there are a lot of choices we can make which reduce our risk. So I want you to keep learning, keep applying this science to your life and uh, keep on transitioning from surviving to thriving. That's why we're here. So Chef AJ, with that, I'm gonna come back to you. Are we back together? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I've been Wonderful. trying to get catch everybody's questions that they have been posting. And that's why I put a link to my website because those that send it in, it's a lot easier for me to gather when you post them here, they disappear quickly. But are you ready for a few questions of Dr. Esser from your Let's wonderful presentation? Okay, that is terrific. Okay, so uh, Kathy says, if babies, or Catherine, excuse me, if babies' immune systems are not mature, then why do they get so many vaccines? That is a really great and a challenging question. And I think there's very little data to support vaccinating children that early as compared to waiting until they have uh, more well-established immune function. So great question. Great. Um, Sherry says, can the intestinal lining heal if somebody has been taking ibuprofen for several weeks? The intestinal lining absolutely can. And that's especially if you've been taking uh, anti-inflammatories for an extended period, you need to be very aggressive with your gut healing plan uh, and just be really on top of that. I'd also say, well, hey, why are we needing those anti-inflammatories? Can we use other things, uh, you know, preferably that can help with that pain that are less toxic? That's terrific. Uh, Karen says, can, can diet heal someone with, the, with psoriasis of scalp and skin? We see amazing results with people with psoriasis. For me, that's been one that's been kind of a, a relative no-brainer. I mean, when people go on an aggressive elimination diet, uh, we see radical changes. The palms healing, the scalp improving. I, it's just been beautiful to see. So, I mean, I've seen everything from, you know, actual autoimmune diseases attacking the muscles where people couldn't even walk within just two weeks, being able to now walk with almost no pain. Uh, to people with their joints chronically swollen and inflamed, resolving. I mean, it's just, you know, story after story, it's beautiful to see. So yes, amazing potential. You've got nothing to lose. Do it four to six weeks. Follow what Chef AJ and I recommend and see what happens. Terrific. Karen says, at what age does the immune system reduce in function? That, so that's a great question because arguably it's not just a chronologic age. It's also an inflammatory and physiologic age. And so it's important that we don't just think of ourselves as, oh, I'm going to be 60. thus my immune system is not where it needs to be. Or I'm going to be 85. thus it's not going to be where it needs to be. No, we should be doing everything we can 
to maximize that immune system function. But we do want to be realistic, just like our collagen changes over time, right? And our joints wear a little bit, some level of wear on our bodies and a little slowing down or what we call cellular senescence will occur. But your goal should say, well, that's not going to occur until I'm well into my 80s. And I think that's a very realistic expectation based on what we see in 100% plant-based eaters who eat that moderate, well-balanced life and with exercise and sleep and all the other factors. Uh, so yeah, so uh, you know, 80s or 90s, that's where we should say we begin to slow down. But if you're eating the standard American diet, we see that in people's 50s, right? Where now they're beginning to decline in function, you know, cardiovascular endurance, so on and so forth. That's great. Uh, where is this question? Uh, but um, oh, Jay says, is eczema an autoimmune response to dysbiosis? There's a strong correlation so that individuals who have dysbiosis, I mean, here's the interesting thing. If you look at the literature more and more, dysbiosis, in other words, this ill health of your intestinal tract related to imbalances of the foods you're eating as well as the bacteria that are living there, appears to not only relate to autoimmune disease, but also to heart disease and a host of other problems because of what's occurring there and the production of various byproducts that can compromise your health. So the first thing to start with, take the dairy out, take the meat out, add more of the minimally processed plant-based foods, and then begin to tinker with that in an elimination diet style way. Do it for three months and see the response of your eczema. And based on its response, then make decisions moving forward from there. 90 yes. plus percent of people who do this of their eczema and these other facts, they, they all improve. It's beautiful to see. Terrific. Becky says, are canker sores a symptom of an immune response? So canker sores are a part of the immune system and the mucosal lining of the mouth. By themselves, they can be related to different types of autoimmune diseases or infectious diseases in our body. Uh, so if you begin to get canker sores, that's a sign to you that your immune system is likely a suppressed or dysfunctional. And it's crucial. This is saying, wake up, wake up. <laughs> I'm not where I need to be. You need to get me healthy. Um, so that's a reminder. Right? You need more sleep. You need better nutrition, so on and so forth. Terrific. Let's see. Lori, sa Lori says, can you reverse Hashimoto's thyroiditis? Depends upon where you are in the process. If the immune, if the thyroid itself has been so heavily damaged past a certain point, then probably not. Uh, if, however, it's very early on and you're just seeing early signs, it's possible. And so making those aggressive changes, getting the gluten out, getting the meat and the dairy out, getting down the toxic exposures of all the cosmetic products and et cetera, is absolutely worth doing and tracking very carefully your thyroid function over about eight weeks, then getting your TSH, T3, T4 autoantibodies all retested and seeing what's happened. And for some people, yes, if it's early on enough, seeing beautiful responses. For other people, no, they're too deep into it. Terrific, thank you. Okay, uh, this is a hot topic, so if you don't wanna answer, it's okay, but Andrew wants to know what you think about the flu shot and vaccines in general. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is a really challenging conversation just because it is such a emotional and political, it's become at least laden, you know, piece. So I actually will plead like Switzerland on this and say, my recommendation to people is to make informed decisions uh, and make decisions in the best interest of their family, children, and themselves. As far as the flu vaccine, I think it's somewhat of a no-brainer. Uh, I don't think that uh, the flu vaccine is a particular value to an otherwise healthy population or healthy individual. And I think my opinion on that is actually backed up by the Cochrane meta-analysis out of Sweden and Norway, where they do these big analyses of all the data. Uh, and mainly because, remember, the flu vaccine is designed for the flu types that were from a year or two before, not necessarily for this year. So a large majority of the time, it's not even helpful for you. And so the risk benefit of that doesn't make sense, right? Because you get the vaccine and it comes with risk and toxins in your body, et cetera, but do you really even get much benefit? Now you could argue if you've been somebody who's had, let's say cancer recently and have been on chemotherapies and your immune system is compromised severely, for you, it might be the right choice. So I tell people, make an informed decision, do your reading and education, and make your own decisions on that, yeah? That's, that's my Swiss, Switzerland response. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So we have two questions on ulcerative colitis. Lori says, do you have any input on ulcerative colitis? Actually, and if you know about the effect of 
EVOO avocado oil on gut permeability in ulcerative colitis. I am not familiar with the studies on EVOO and gut permeability. Uh, what is fascinating, of course, is there are many different little products or supplements or medications, et cetera, that can influence gut permeability. And certainly they have their place. But if you've ever seen my little triangle pyramid that I often show people, I say the foundation of all of us for our healthcare should be our lifestyle. And then we move up from there, whether it be to physical modalities or supplements or medications or surgeries. Uh, so as far as ulcerative colitis, a plant-based program that is well thought out uh, initially uh, is absolutely a place that we all should start for our ulcerative colitis. And only if that is inadequate or failing to help the individual, then we move forward with the, the various medications and things of that kind. Because remember I said, so I have a very realistic perspective on this because I've seen it for, you know what, just like you, right, for about 40 years, is that there's some people that do amazing and other people do not. That doesn't mean you're a bad person or you shouldn't feel shame or like you're a failure. It is you've maximized everything you can do, but you also want to be real. Have you maximized everything you can do? So in other words, taking gluten out for five days and saying, why are my symptoms not better? That's not it, right? So, I'm, so just being realistic about it. And, and especially if someone who's viewing this has significant, let's say ulcerative colitis with significant weight loss and bloody bowel movements, et cetera, they should have good guidance. And they really need to have somebody guide them through the process of the, the food modifications in order to be sure that what they're doing are the right choices. Lori's saying, but it's, is it better to be oil free? Well, I think being oil free is excellent for us for a lot of reasons. And, uh, you know, everything from the cardiovascular health to the excess of calorie consumption and the like. So I, I'm not familiar with any really good data on the avocado oil as a standalone thing for people with ulcerative colitis, but I'll do my research and get back to you. Thank you. A uh, question from Peggy, has any of your patients successfully avoided a knee replacement? Yes. So knee replacements for people when they have completely, you know, they have severe 10 out of 10 pain all day, every day, their knee literally is bone on bone. On x-ray, there's just nothing left they've lost motion, et cetera. Those people, they need a knee replacement. But if you've still got some motion in your knee and it's, you know, from about a zero degrees of extension to past 90 plus, and let's say you are carrying extra weight and you do have other disease processes, you're a perfect candidate to go on Chef AJ's and my concept program, right? And moving forward with healthy living, lose the excess weight, get off the medications, reduce inflammation, improve blood flow to the joints. And for the majority of people, yeah, they, they don't need that knee replacement, at least certainly not in the time frame they may have been described. I have a guy not too long ago, he came to me, he was 54. They was told he was bone on bone and he needed a knee replacement. He came and saw me and he said, what else can I do? And I said, hey, I'm gonna try to walk outside with you guys. I know it's getting a little dark in this room. And, uh, and I said, well, try my little four week cleanup program. He did it, lost 27 pounds in 28 days. His pain improved 80%. We put a little PRP in his knee and he's still three years out and has no knee pain. So yeah. That's terrific. Do you want to talk about your four week program? Because they're actually, you know, this feed goes so fast for me. That's why I like the mailed in question, emailed in questions, because somebody did ask about the four week program. Well, I mean, the four week program is really just a nice, cleanly written out sort of plant based only approach with a lot of micronutrient rich foods. It tells you exactly what to eat every day, just very clean and clearly written out for folks. And what I tried to do when I created it was to create something that had, you know, no it's SOS, of course, no salt, oil, or sugar added in it. And it has, you know, foods that are commonly available to most people, sweet potatoes and black beans and rice and things that you can pick up at most stores. Uh, you know, a lot of the fun exotic stuff are fun to eat, uh, but really for some people, they're more challenging to, you know, come by, et cetera. So I wanted to go with basic, simple foods that are easy, you know, 10 minute recipes, simple to make, you eat the same thing at night, the next day at lunch, and very filling. So as you love to show, I love your photos always, the amount of volume, I actually was just answering people's emails on Facebook a minute ago, we're like, do I have to eat all this? <laughs> and I was like, no, just eat till you're full, but make sure you start with a salad, right? So make sure you start with those greens and then move forward from there. And so just trying to make something that was very doable for people uh, and powerful, right? Because at the heart of it, if you and I make changes, we want to see results, uh, you know? And so that little four week program has been something I've used for the last five years in my clinic. And so many people were getting good results, I decided to put it out there, put it on the internet. So it created just a nice version of it that people could download and use. 
and uh, it's powerful. I mean, that's what's cool because the average man loses 20 to 40 pounds in one month doing it. The average woman, 15 to 25. 80% of people get off blood pressure meds, 70 to 80% get off their diabetic meds. And we've got an average of 30 to 90% improvement in pain in people's joints. So that's what's cool because I now have all this data because I've seen so many people do it and they're all better. What, what, what's kind of funny is now if I see somebody back in clinic sometime, I'll be like, hey, did I ever give you my program? And they'll be like, Dr. Esser, you gave it to me like four months ago. Remember, I'm 30 pounds down already. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah that's right, that's right. Good job, keep going. <laughs> you know, they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm still losing. I'm like, great job, keep rocking it. Um, but it's beautiful. I mean, that's when I do this for people, that's what's so much fun is to see them getting well. And so I've incorporated that. Maybe one night you and I can do a whole talk on joints and inflammation, um, you know, because that's at the heart of this is perfusion, is blood flow, is inflammation, plus the weight reduction. And uh, so, yeah, so it's just, it's right there with my needle and my syringe when I'm doing injections for people, et cetera. It's food that is at the heart of, you know, the, the cure. Yeah. Hey, that is fantastic. Uh, Shraddha says, can you ask Dr. Esser as to how to eat clean vegan diet like he recommends for kidney patients who cannot have uh, things high in potassium like potatoes and tomatoes? Can you make a meal plan for overall health that includes kidney health? Absolutely. And I think that one of the things that's when people have significant problems, the first things I'd say is this, for people who have, let's say, chronic renal insufficiency, stage one, stage two, and stage three, all those people, like I had a person who was 74, that's what it was, 100 pounds overweight on about 10 medications, stage three renal failure, and they did my four-week detox and lost again like 30 pounds and reversed their stage three renal failure, which is really cool, and got off a bunch of their blood pressure medicines, et cetera. So for people who uh, you know, are in those early stages, one, two, and three of renal insufficiency, a plant-based program is ideal and can be just right there. You don't have to worry about the potassium and all the rest. Now, if you're on dialysis, well, you probably don't have to worry there most of the time either because they're just gonna dialyze you every couple of days. So really, if you're worried a lot about this, what I encourage people to do is find a good nutritionist who's well-versed in plant-based nutrition and can sit down with you and draw up a whole menu plan. Like I've got a bunch here in Jacksonville that I work with, but if the person says, I'm really concerned about it, I said, let's sit down and let's track this. Uh, but also having their primary care track their potassium levels and the like as they begin a healthy living program. And the majority of the time, we're good to go. Uh, but again, if they're extraordinarily sensitive to the potassium levels, et cetera, well, we map it out, right? But don't forget, here's the interesting thing. A lot of drugs that people take have significant negative side effects on the kidney and can actually result in quote, disease itself. So it's a perfect example, 77 year old African-American lady saw me in clinic, has knee pain. I said, try my program. She goes home, does the four week program, but she forgets to track her blood pressure and all the rest. Goes, ends up in the ED, in the in emergency room because she's lightheaded and passing out. And they're like, what are you doing to your kidneys? You're destroying your kidneys on this crazy program. Well, it was because she was on two blood pressure meds plus a diuretic, right? Which was, you know, if you will, whipping her kidneys and damaging them. What, as soon as we got her off all the medicines because she didn't need them anymore, because she was now healthy, kidneys went back completely normal. And so I had a, it's funny, I had a, prim, I had a doctor the other day, a primary care doctor. She was doing the healthy living program and she got her husband to do it. She's like, oh, he's really lightheaded when he's doing his pushups and he thinks he's not getting enough protein. And I said, have you checked his blood pressure? And she goes, oh, duh, I'm a primary care doctor. I should have checked that. So she checked his blood pressure he was on two blood pressure meds, but since he was doing my program, he had lost 20 pounds in three weeks and he no longer needed his blood pressure meds. So she got off the blood pressure meds. He felt great, had nothing to do with inadequate protein consumption. So, yeah. Nice. <laughs> two questions on PRP. One from Florence watching live who wants to know if it's something you do commonly in your practice and what's involved. And one from Heidi who's saying, do you only shoot the plasma or stem cells into one specified area one time, or do you shoot in and around the area several times? And which do you think is the best treatment? Because one of her shoulders has tendinosis and the other has slight tears that are being treated with PRP and stem cells. I, I wrote her back and told her to have a consultation because people can actually have a consultation with you. Oh, my, my cat, one of the outdoor cats just walked up, wants to say hi, Chef AJ. Oh my God, this he's gorgeous. Hello, hello. Yes, she's a sweetie. <laughs> so um, to answer that question, so as most of you may or may not know, PRP is platelet-rich plasma. So about 2% of the volume of your blood are platelets. The rest is plasma and red blood cells. 
So platelets are loaded with about 60 different types of growth factors. So when we concentrate your platelets, we're taking all your growth factors to put in a specific area. So PRP itself, have I done a lot of them? I've probably only done about 5,000. Um, so yes, I've done quite a few over the last couple of years. Um, and I do them pretty much every day for people. If you look at the literature, there are different studies that would suggest one injection for an area versus a series of three or four. Uh, I tell patients it depends on what they have. If they have a soft tissue injury, like a little minor tear of a tendon or a ligament, sometimes just one is enough. If you have moderate arthritis of a joint, then a series of three spread out by two weeks in between or one week in between is what the literature or the scientific studies would suggest is beneficial. When I inject PRP, it depends on what I'm trying to target. So I may sometimes just go one into just into the joint and inject into it so it spreads throughout the joint. Or I'll, I always use an ultrasound or x-ray to guide my injections. So if I'm using the ultrasound, I may also pepper the ligaments, some outside tendons, the capsule of the joint, as well as inside. <laughs> I'm laughing because the cat is rubbing on the computer that I just walked out here with. <laughs> so, so such a beautiful background. Yes, very blessed. And um, so yeah, so PRP is wonderful, but you need to have somebody who knows what they're doing do it. And it should be injected under guidance. Uh, and multiple injections often are beneficial. Sometimes just one is enough. Great. Janet asks, thank you for doing these shows during lockdown. And she says, how does the immune system of an over 65 year old with no other risk factors, BMI 19, eating whole food plant exclusively SOS free react to the COVID-19 infection? How does age play into immunity response to the virus? So the studies that presently exist suggest that age is a risk factor, right, for severity of disease. Now, this may be age itself, or more likely it's related to physiologic inflammation at the cellular level, along with the other risk factors that come often with age, such as impaired blood flow due to chronic coronary artery disease, such as impaired you know, glucose metabolism with people with diabetes, impaired you know, kidney function and the like. We know that in America, unfortunately, as people age, more people take anti-inflammatories, which if you look at the studies that I was putting on Instagram and Facebook about six weeks ago, we know that the use of anti-inflammatories suppresses uh, good immune responses. Uh, so there are a lot of factors that, uh, that influence that, uh, my answer to that question. So long story short is the older you are, right? So past the age of 65, et cetera, uh, it's crucial that you're really maximizing your immune health even more than when you were 20 or 18, et cetera. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. This might be another loaded question like the vaccine one. You don't have to answer. It's from Dina. What are your thoughts on mammograms? Uh, you know, so again, uh, as a man who lacks breasts, uh, you know, from a personal perspective, uh, my opinion, again, is I think that people need to make personal informed decisions. Uh, my, uh, as a physician uh, with a woman who I love who does have breasts, my wife, I will say that my expectation for my wife as she ages, as we've talked about this, is ideally what I'll get for her are MRIs of the breasts rather than mammography. And because if you may have seen some of the studies that show that if you take women and they begin mammography earlier in life, than another group of women, they actually have higher rates of breast cancer over time. And so we want to remember mammography does come with radiation exposure. So the classic study I'm quoting to you is actually women who had high genetic inheritance risk uh, for the, uh, you know, breast cancer. And what they did is they started screening some early and some after five or 10 years later and getting yearly mammograms versus not yearly. And those who got the yearly had higher rates of uh, breast cancer over time. And so just radiation is real. So people forget this. Even when they walk into my clinic, they're like, well, I want an x-ray of this, an x-ray of that. I'm like, whoa, 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 remember something. This is real. It's not just a picture. So when you think about it, we used to begin using x-rays initially to treat acne until all the people started getting thyroid cancer. And then we used x-rays and sears. They would size your shoes by putting your foot in an x-ray box, taking an x-ray of your foot and giving the exact size until people started getting bone cancer in their feet. So x-ray is real and it comes to the real risk. So if you can afford it, because insurance won't pay for it, I tell women, get an MRI of your breast rather than a mammography. And it's much more sensitive and much better anyway. Um, but 
you know, again, do it to, you have to think through that and make informed decisions. Yeah. You know, I, I think about that. It's just that like, you can't even go to a dentist. I mean, like I, I moved from LA to the Palm Springs area and because I'm going to a new dentist, like they won't even clean my teeth if, right. if, if, if I don't succumb to x-rays. I mean, how, what can you do if, if, you know, it's frustrating. I know. So frustrating. And so that's where you a try to select dentists who are, you know, a little bit more conservative with x-ray use um, and B, you know, keep on eating the healthy food that ideally, you know, decreases your risk of cancer in other ways. So, yeah. Great. Question about what is your treatment for shin splints? Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that it's truly a shin splint, right? And so that classic shin splint being inflammation or irritability of some of the insertion points of muscles and tendons into your bone of your leg. Uh, and not that it's a true stress reaction or a stress fracture of the bone. So I see a lot of people, I've just got shin splints and I'm like, I'm not sure. They hurt when they hop up and down on just one foot. They have some osteoporosis. Let's say they've ramped up their volume in running and I press around the bone and it hurts. I go, no, 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 we need an MRI of your shin. Sure enough, it shows a stress fracture. Well, that treatment is much different than a shin splint. Truly, if it's low level pain on the front of your shins, it's been there for years. Whenever you start walking, it bothers you a bit. Well, first of all, let's stretch, 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 stretch your calves out, stretch your quads out, stretch uh, your big toe out, get good mobility around your ankle. Uh, the next one is some good manual massage, myofascial massage to your tibialis anterior, the muscle on the front of your uh, leg in the front there, uh, as well as the use obviously of ice, et cetera. The next is looking at your shoe wear. Do you, if you've got flat feet, do you have some good full length medial arch supports? Don't have to be expensive ones, but something that gives a little cushion in there, like some power steps or Spanko or super feet, uh, some different versions that are very affordable online. And, uh, and then making sure, like if you're a runner, did you, have, did you violate the twos? Did you go too far, too fast, too soon? Or are you building up slowly, right? So these are all important factors. And also some people forget, this is a kinetic chain, right? So it's when you hit the ground, the ground hits you back and you have to absorb that force in your body. So if you're carrying a lot of extra weight, running should not be for you, nor even prolonged walking. We should get that weight off with food, right? With Chef AJ and my advice and recommendations, and then that you're, do your cardio on a stationary bike, an elliptical or swimming, if that's where you want to get your, you know, because you want that cardiovascular exercise, it's great for you, but not the pounding on a hard surface. Yeah. Because a lot of people, when they're still overweight, they come see me and they'll go, well, I've started my exercise routine, but now my joints hurt me. I go, whoa, I don't need you to be pounding on the, you know, the ground all the time. Let's stop. Let's back up. Right, let's start the food first, reduce inflammation, get the weight off quickly, and now hit your cardio in a way that doesn't beat your joints up. Because it does us no good if we lose that weight, but now we've destroyed our joints because of all that extra weight we were pounding through the joints. That's great. Susan says, tell Dr. Esser I'm coming from San Francisco to see him. And it, you guys don't always have to come to see him because if you go to EsserHealth.com, you can actually book a consultation with him uh, without traveling. But I'm much nicer in person. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's funny. So people have follow-up questions on the mammography. They're asking what you think of thermography. And if somebody is getting an MRI of the breasts, how often do they need to do it? So no good data there. Thermography, though, there is good data. Thermography is nice. I mean, it shows up heat patterns on the skin and would suggest if there's a significant inflammatory neoplasm or you know, cancer growing. However, if you look at the data, Thermography is not nearly as good as mammography, nor is it as nearly as good as MRIs of the breast for actually identifying uh, breast lesions or breast cancer. So uh, thermography is a nice little addition, uh, but not, I don't think it should be the standalone, especially if you're at high risk for breast cancer. Uh, which brings us always back to you can't change your family history, but you, and you can't change what you've done in the past, but you can change today. So today is the day that if you're worried about your breasts, you should be filling up with the fruits and the vegetables and all the rest, not worrying about your breasts. You should be filling up with the foods that love your breasts, right? And that keep them healthy and reduce inflammation and reduce the growth of breast cancer. So long story short is though, if you're gonna do an MRI of the breasts, I would probably say every three to five years, I do not have good data to back that up. That's purely on some literature that I've looked at. Uh, but again, uh, it's not the recommendation by a lot of the breast cancer organizations purely because insurance doesn't pay for it. That's why they don't have those recommendations. But breast MRI is far more sensitive than mammography. 
in the studies. And, and Karen is saying, who reads the MRI? Is it a radiologist? Radiologist. That's yes. what I thought. I so for that. example, I have a friend here in town who's plant-based for years, but has a strong family history of breast cancer. And every you know couple of years or so, she'll write me and say, hey, can you just write me a script for a breast MRI? You know, And I'll say, sure, no problem. I write it. And she goes and does it cash pay. And its costs are about $250. That's all. Because you want to remember most MRI places, these standalone MRI places, not in hospitals, but the standalone private places, they all do cash pay MRIs. So if you want an MRI, like I have patients all the time, they don't have insurance, they don't have good insurance, they have high deductibles. And I go, hey, can you write me an MRI? I say, absolutely. We get an MRI of any body part for anywhere from 250 to 350. That's what the going rate is here in, you know, in this area of Florida and Jacksonville. So sure. if you ever want an MRI of your breasts or of your brain or of your neck, and you just want it because you would feel better having it, just have a doctor write you a script for it. You, know, you can get it. Wow. Too yeah. bad they can't do the whole body at one time, you know. <laughs> That'd be great. Total That's MRI. Right. All right. Scout says, I had left full hip replacement. Doctor said I have hip dysplasia. Plant-based now for three years. BMI is 18. My right hip is starting to bother me. Can I avoid a second hip replacement? I'm 67 and I live in Florida. So, so, so hip dysplasia, for those of your viewers out there, a hip joint's made of a ball and a socket, and they fit together in a certain way. If the socket is too shallow, there's a lot of play here and you break up the cartilage, or if it's too deep, you end up breaking down the joint as well. So there's a perfect sweet spot where the cup and the socket fit just right to keep the wear at a low level. So if you had already a hip dysplasia, which means the hip joint was a little off the way you were made in your mother's womb, that means you wore your hip down a little sooner than maybe you would have otherwise. So if you already had that for years and the one side wore out, it's plausible that mechanically you still may wear out this other hip and require a replacement. However, what are things you can do? Excellent stretching and flexibility, especially your hip flexors and your hamstrings. Good strength of your lateral hips and your glutes in a non-load bearing way like Pilates and swimming. Having a good therapist do traction on your hip regularly, a little SI joint mobilization. Then the use of things like acupuncture as good modalities. There also are hip braces, one of them made by a company called Oser, called a hip unloader. Some people wear when they're jogging or exercising, it unloads the hip so there's less force. And then of course the use of PRP or platelet-rich plasma and other types of injections of that kind. These are all reasonable. Plus, bumping up your turmeric, your boswellia, your ginger, your onions and garlic consumption that all reduce inflammation and slow the degenerative process. Because you want to remember that the cells of your joints, they're talking to each other constantly, plus they're receiving nutrition from your blood vessels. And it shows in the new studies that there's crosstalk. So when you're eating healthy food, you're actually turning back on the health of these joint cells versus turning them off. So, yeah. Right. Jay Great said job they, going plant-based, by the way. Keep rocking it, buddy. Jay said that uh, she just, or she or he, it's just the letter J, so I apologize. I don't know. Uh, it got your four-week detox and is excited to get started. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more question. I know we've gone a little bit over. Julie says, what do you think about cortisone injections into joints, helpful or hurtful? I had a consultation this week with Dr. Goldhammer, and he told me not to get a steroid injection. Right. Well, Dr. Goldhammer is crazy. I mean, I'm just kidding. I love, I love Dr. Goldhammer, obviously. So we're good friends. So steroid injections, A, let's think about it. Number one, it's not meant to be in your body. It was never there to begin with. Our body produces cortisone in small pulsatile fashion throughout the day. It circulates through the bloodstream. Large quantities of synthetic cortisone placed in a joint are toxic to the joint. So yes, ideally, we do not want to have that in the joint if possible. So we want to avoid that if possible. That's where use of things like prolotherapy, play-rich plasma, autologous stem cells, these are all reasonable, but we'd like to avoid steroids. That's number one. Number two though, we also have to think about quality of life. So let's say I've got that person, right, who's bone on bone, who's 70, 80, 80, whatever, they can hardly even walk and not be active, and they are not a candidate for knee replacement or other things like that, or they haven't even tried anything yet, but they're bone on bone, a steroid injection to give them six months, whatever, of good quality of life to be more active, et cetera, then the risk benefit is very different. But if you're having an otherwise healthy joint, or if you don't have severe end stage arthritis, I prefer you to avoid steroid in the body. Because remember, steroid injections increase the risk of osteoporosis, cataracts, glaucoma, diabetes, all these bad things. 
Plus, there was a study recently in which people got steroid injections versus salt water in their joints. They followed them for two years with x-ray and MRI. And those who got the steroid had double the rate of arthritis as those who got the salt water over two years. So yes, Dr. Goldhammer is right. Try that's, not to get the steroid if you can avoid them. That's great. So um, for the consult, I, I just put the website Esser Health because there's not really, I've just been looking on your website. There doesn't right, seem to be a there specific. Is a, there, there is, and because we've been going back and forth, you know, it's what the hard thing is, yeah, I'm in clinic, you know, all day helping folks, which I love. And so fitting people in for consults is challenging, but I'm always happy to try where I can. Uh, and actually even through SOS, Southeast Orthopedics, where I work, we're offering telemedicine consults, things like that as well. So uh, we're, we're here to try to serve where we can. Okay. I was going to let you go, but I, I want to see if I know the answer to this question just from interviewing so many doctors. George Ann says, I have osteopenia. How do I build bone density without pounding the pavement? Greens, eat greens. I love it. That's obviously the first place to start. Why? Because they're alkalizing next because they're a great source of bio bioavailable calcium, right? And next they're fiber rich, feed your gut flora, improve overall health. Uh, and the tertiary wise, right? Uh, they also crowd out your plate. So you're not eating all the other junk foods that impair your bone density. And we can do some studies on, or pardon me, a whole talk on osteoporosis and bone health one of these days if you want. Uh, I will also say, right, simple things, those weight bearing exercises, those exercises that pull on your tendons a little bit to help build bone. Uh, the other thing to remember is it's not just how fragile your bone is, it's also how your reaction time is, how your balance is, et cetera. Because if you're gonna fall, right, where you might break a hip, et cetera, well, if you've got great balance and great reaction time, you're far less, far less likely to fall and less likely to have these injuries that end up harming your bones to begin with. So yeah, wow. and all those other junk things that we need to get out of there to overall get you healthy. Wow. Well, we'd love to have you do a talk on osteoporosis, joint health, any really any subject. To, hearing from you would be great, whatever the subject. We'll so do please, it. You're, you have an open invitation. And thank you so much for being my my what's the, the, the guest with the most appearances so far. But All Doug right. Lyle, uh, the guest <laughs> tomorrow, Dr. Doug Lyle, is going to be breathing down your back. So oh, <laughs> man. I might have to send you a check so I can get back on again. <laughs> Absolutely not. But thank you so much, Dr. Esser. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you guys for so much for watching. And I'm, I'm sure Dr. Esser will be back and he'll do a whole show about bone health at, because he is so inspiring and so passionate. Tomorrow we start the regular time of 11 a.m. So please come back for a live Q&A with Dr. Doug Lyle. I can't believe it's still light where you are, Dr. Esser. It's like 8 o'clock. Uh, is it awesome? It's 8.08. It's still gorgeous out here. Yeah, you can see. I wish you could see there are these swallowtail kites that are just floating up in the sky. They're so beautiful. And then in about 20 minutes, the bats will start coming out. So, uh, you know, all of your viewers out there, wherever you are, try to find beauty around you and get outdoors a little bit tonight if it's safe in your neighborhood and just drink in a little bit of the beauty wherever you are. So, I love it. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Esser. I All hope right, my to friend. see you soon.